Um, we're going to take a minute and introduce ourselves, and we're going to have a little bit of fun here. So we're going to do like a two-parter, as they may say. We're going to do a little bit of Q&A, and I'm going to challenge the folks that are on stage here. And then we're going to go with a five-minute break and get into the nitty-gritty on, so what's this all about, and what's eSports, and how do you do it, and what does it all mean? So let's go ahead and uh, start. I'm Gerald Solomon. I'm the executive director of the Samueli Foundation. I'm Terry Kraft, and I'm chief eSports strategist for the Emerald Foundation. Hi, Constance Sankler. I'm a researcher for the eSports program. I'm at UCI. And I'm Joe Bessiger. Some of you saw me at lunch. I'm the founder and CEO of Emerald Asset Management. And uh, last year, I ran into uh, two of these people here and learned about what I thought was one of the greatest opportunities to make a disruptive change in education. And that's what we're here to talk to you about. So let's go ahead and get started and see where it all takes us. Put the volume on. Well, let's go back. Start again. You guys got the volume ready? Ready. Okay. Please welcome to the stage, I know what you're thinking. Professional video games. Seriously? Well, yeah. This is serious business. Get that image of a soda chugging, frozen pizza eating geek who never leaves his bedroom out of your head. Esports is the real deal like Evander Holyfield. Don't believe me? Doesn't matter. I got the facts to prove it. You may think it's about mashing buttons at random. No! Esports has got human reflexes fast enough to teach you same bolt a thing or two about getting off the blocks. Got enough fans to make the NHL slip and slide. We <laughs> got more drama than an episode of Game of Thrones. Tell me more. Tell me more. Okay. Well, now that I've got your attention, let me break it down for you. Huge tournaments are held all over the world with audiences of up to 113,000 people in attendance, and that's dwarfed by the online viewership. With some tournaments reaching 34 million viewers by a platform such as Twitch. Sponsors are getting involved, pouring in boatloads of cash. That's a real measurement, right? Esports is set to become a billion dollar industry by the end of 2017, but the prize money is already turning these teenagers into multi-millionaires. So what do they play? A lot of different games. Esports is an all-encompassing term for a variety of games, from multiplayer online battle arenas, or MOBAs, like League of Legends, to first-person shooters like Counter-Strike. So where's it going, you say? Virtual reality and all those bigger, better things! So why haven't I heard of it? Because you've been living under a rock. <laughs> and follow CNN's guide to awake from your slumber and get ready to join the esports generation. So that's a little bit of an intro as to what this is as far as a concept. We're going to spend the next half hour, and I'm going to kind of ping some questions at the panel here. And then, as I said, we'll take a five-minute break, and then we'll get into kind of the details of what all of this is about. Um, so I'm going to direct the first question to Joe Bessaker. For those of you who may not know Joe, Joe uh, runs a large asset management company. And my question to you is, Joe, what the heck are you doing? talking about this concept called North America Scholastic Esports Federation when you have a fiduciary responsibility to all these people to manage billions of dollars. Well, thanks, Gerald. And I've never been accused of being perfectly sane. So um, I've been coming to this conference for eight years. I have some of my counterparts, Joe Garner, Derek Fisher, and we're a money management company. And one of the things we do when we come here, we have a 20 person, we're actually a research firm. We have 20 people that do research on both private and public companies. We hope to buy these companies or know about them when they're small so that when they come public, we'll, we'll know and be able to have an advantage about the rest of the street on that. So over the years, we've invested in companies that have been showing what they do here. A great example that many of you might have heard of Chegg. Uh, and uh, Chegg came public uh, a number of years ago. It was not the greatest IPO in the world, but because we had deep knowledge of them, we stayed with it. Now it's been one of, <coughs> one of their largest shareholders, and it's been a huge home run for us. So last year, uh, I was not going to come. Uh, 
I had registered, and I started getting these emails from the Tiger Woods Foundation saying that there was going to be a presentation on esports in STEM. Emerald has, for myself, my wife, and the rest of the firm, started a foundation a number of years ago. And what our outreach to kids is something that we do, and not just kids, all kinds of stuff. I don't have time to tell you about that. But one of the areas that we were really interested in was STEM and helping youth with STEM. I've always believed that STEM is a gateway to much better outcomes for kids. I did not always believe that video games and esports were a good thing. I'm the father of four teenagers. I hated bleeping video games and esports. <laughs> and I'm struggling because the words that I used to use was not bleeping. It was a very, I very much misunderstood what esports and gaming was about. And through being a research analyst, I started to look at other things that were happening in the space. Some of those numbers, the guy said you were living under a lot, rock, right? I was living under a rock. I was blinded by my kids doing this and not liking it when I think they should be doing something else. But doing all that research, it made very clear to me that I was missing something. I was under that rock. So I took it back to the ground floor. And I said, let me look at this. And what I started to find out, or what you'll find out today, that eSports, very much, we all know the relationship of sports and learning and the good things there. What we didn't know until this great lady and Gerald came about, started to show us that not only were eSports great, or regular sports great for learning and education, but eSports really have the potential to be that on steroids. So I went and heard these, I w went and heard, uh, yeah, I didn't mean it with real right. steroids. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> no <pun intended>. yeah. <laughs> so I, I got here last year, went upstairs, there was a room with much less people than you, and they made a presentation. I thought I knew a lot about, I was pioneering this space of eSports and STEM. We were doing some things at our foundation building. I thought I knew a lot. When I went to hear them speak, I realized very quickly that I knew very little. And what they have done, and I'll let them tell you what they have done, is to create an ecosystem where you take, if you don't take any numbers away, just remember this, that 91% of all kids 25 and under have a high interest in gaming and esports. There is no other regular sports, theater, music, art, that can come anywhere close to that number. As a matter of fact, I would guess you could combine a lot of those and it wouldn't reach the number of that. So when you have that, you have that ability to reach a kid, wherever that kid is, whether it's an urban setting, a, you know, out in the suburbs, whatever, you have that ability, you now can talk their language because that's what they're interested in. And now we can take that, what they've done and what we've done together is mold and infuse some type of curriculum and some type of learning that the curriculum that they put together is spectacular. So uh, do I have a video? No. Yeah. I showed it at lunch. I was in charge of this. Gerald's in charge, so I guess my video got cut. Um, no, but uh, cuts, cuts will, will fill for you. An aha moment for me was that video that I showed you there. That Chairman Powell testifying to the Senate Subcommittee said that the biggest root cause of the economic challenges that we have in the United States today was educational stagnation. How do you change that? I believe what they're working on has the ability to turn the world on its head. I think it's one of the biggest opportunities I've ever seen to get to a kid, to, to embrace that kid, and th let them thrive. And without them knowing, we're educating them in many ways. So I'll turn it over to Gerald. If you get a chance, we have that online. Uh, that it's a very compelling video as a business person. One of the things that Joe Garner, Derek, and I do, we make over 2,000 company visits a year. Almost every day, we hear corporate America say that we would have more jobs, we could pay more if these people had the skills that were needed today. And they're not getting them. And that's not from academia, it's not from philanthropy, this is from coming from hardcore business. This will make that a very, we can very importantly change that, and they'll explain how. So that's a good segue into Constance. So Constance, you're a full professor at the University of California, Irvine. You were a full professor in Wisconsin. You served at uh, Office of Science, Technology, and Policy in the Obama White House. Yeah. What in the world got you into thinking 
that there was some kind of value or opportunity around what we're talking about called esports and STEM and learning and all of that? So uh, my background is education and STEM learning. I'm a learning scientist. I got into games. I was a non-gamer. I started studying games because the, the kinds of activities kids were engaging in, they were spending more time on average per day than homework, and it was more demanding than what any homework we would ever provide in something like high school. So I started studying games about 15 years ago and have been studying them ever since um, under Obama and policy thinking about how can we make games that might actually be great for kids, that might actually address some of the big issues we have in our nation. I had paid attention to esports, but not, not avidly, right? Um, at that time, esports was, really was really coming out of Asia. Um, and the, the, the framing of sports around video games seemed curious, but really outside of my discipline. And then I went, I moved to UCI recently, about two years ago, and we have the number one esports program there. So I go down, you know, on like a Friday to see what's happening in their event. And it is jam packed with hundreds of college kids who've like painted their bodies and are screaming for their favorite teams. And I thought, oh my God, what is this? Like, no one likes watching other people play video games, right? Uh, it turns out, yes, they do on platforms like Twitch and others. But I immediately wanted to understand what is so interesting and compelling about the sports frame and how might we be thinking about, like, what does that, that framing of competition lend to it? So as you had said earlier, you know, we know at this point there's over a decade of research about how games and simulations are great for learning, for whom and under what conditions. Fairly established literature there. But on esports, it was really new. And so we started delving into, well, what are people doing when they're participating in esports? And what would this sports frame bring to us? And it turns out quite a bit. So, um, you know, much of the sports literature shows that kids, in fact, a lot of it, a lot of the research actually um, kind of ended around mid-90s, a lot of the big questions about what is the uh, academic impact of being enrolled in sports in, say, high school and middle school. Because the consensus was that it's really positive. It's associated with everything from higher GPA and, um, you know, uh, more positive relationships with adults at school which tend to keep kids in school longer, especially minority kids and kids at risk, all the way over to things like, you know, um, for young women who play basketball or other sports, they actually do well in STEM, do better in STEM, regardless of what the sport is about. And all the women in this audience surely know what I'm talking about, right? If you've ever had to play on a sports team, you kind of get used to some of the culture that is more traditionally a male space and so a lot of the girls in school who were enrolled in sports were actually faring better in STEM because they had more tenacity for it. So as we started looking at what was going on in esports we were really blown away that um, the fans that we saw painting their bodies and cheering for teams were doing a ton of work beyond that. So we spent about a year and a half building out a model of like well what are those other roles and it turns out they're pretty rich. So the esports community is not just the competing teams playing video games, but includes everything from content to creation over to what they call working on the meta or data analysis, literally doing data analytics as a form of play on video games, over to event organizing and a ton of work around hospitality, IT infrastructure, etc. And then the fourth sort of big quadrant was looking at how they're doing things around fundraising, business, graphic design, marketing, et cetera. So that's really where I sort of shifted gears and wanted to pay a lot of attention to what's happening to esports now. It's a very rich space conceptually. So Terry, you were involved in nonprofit work, education work. You're in a STEM ecosystem program in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. You s devoted your career to STEM learning in education. Why did you move from a stable position <laughs> um, working in a field that had proven evidence um, to become what is now known as an eSports specialist? What is it about this concept called NASEF, the North America Scholastic eSports Federation, that drew you to this and makes sense to you? Well, uh, I most recently was a leader for a uh, nature and science museum, and the uh, direction that we took that museum changed rapidly over the last three years that I've been there, and it was really moved <coughs> towards STEM. 
and understanding that the uh, artifacts and the specimens that we had in that were really an opportunity to be able to create excitement and learning, uh, creating a, a museum without walls, et cetera, to be able to excite and interest these students. Our ecosystem in our community was full of business leaders looking, actually praying for our organization to be able to con continue to create <coughs> programming and inspiration for that pipeline to get these students excited in STEM careers. So uh, I got immersed in this. I saw the difference that it was making in these students. I understand the impact and the role that we played in workforce development and got really excited about that opportunity. Uh, Joe and I worked together as, as that leader, working with his foundation and uh, as my position on the Lancaster County STEM Alliance. And um, I decided to form my own consulting company. As soon as I did that, I sent him an email saying I was Starting this organization, he said, I'd love to be able to talk to you about this great program, and here we are. I love the NACEF program in eSports because it's not about the eSports. This program is about the education. It's about the learning opportunity. It's about the ecosystem that you see on the screen that, that Constance just talked about. It's about uh, feeling the same way that Joe did with his kids. I have teenagers as well, and I, what are you doing all day in your room? <laughs> you need to go out and, and, don't you have friends, can't you? And here I had no idea actually what was happening with that. Um, and, and all the, uh, the, the communication and the relationship building that was happening with my kids playing video games on the headset with all their other friends from all over the state, including my friend's kids that I had no idea they were even still uh, talking to. But this is a really great opportunity for students to be able to not only learn about uh, themselves, uh, social emotional learning, there's a lot of that that happens with this, but it's also about that ecosystem of all these different positions and that career exploration. So Constance, as you hear, and you read about it all the time, about all the toxicity, the negative stuff, you know, the, just the, the vitriol that comes across online, um, how do you manage that in a situation like this? How do you address it? What do you do in order to mitigate those kinds of behaviors? Wow, uh, so that's a, that's a big, that's a, Big enchilada. I mean, even in the hallway, we were the conversation that everyone is having. It's like three questions in to hi, it's nice to meet you. You're somehow talking about how tense everyone is right now. In the US, I mean, it's not just online. I think that we were talking earlier about mediation and the ability to have conflict or how to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and games are no different, right? The internet is full of. Um, you know, the internet is very uh, enabling for anonymous, hyperbolic, sexist, racist, toxic, intolerant, not listening kinds of behaviors. Um, of course, that all also flows offline. And games aren't, you know, games are not uh, different in that way. I, I would say that, you know, around games, one thing, you know, the, the idea of like teenagers locked in their room, um, I think because of the way we talk about games and media, but games are really a big trigger for a lot of parents of teens. How many of you have teens that game in some fashion? So you might recognize what I'm talking about. There's a lot of frustration around there. And I think that there's this sort of cultural model of like an on off switch. Like we talk about screen time, like your kids should get off screen time. And we really don't get into how to mentor or parent in those online spaces. And the truth is that you know, the forms of sociability that my 9 and 11 year old are engaging in online are really similar to the ways that I engage with my friends, on, uh, my, my friends in our, you know, in our cul-de-sac, in our creek, in our field. Now they do it online. They're doing that same form of socialization. But the difference is that our model as adults to say that it's about screen time and on and off and that what you're going to do as a parent is regulate how long they're on screens sort of abdicates that space to nothing but kids, right? Like, there, it's very difficult, it's very rare that you find um, gamers whose parents or who have caring sort of older peers who help them think about how to behave online or how to resolve conflict or how to not, you know, how to not tilt, as they say in esports, like how to not get emotional and start making riskier decisions that lead toward failure. So one thing that's really... For me, I've been studying games and kids and building programs for 15 years. 
But the thing that is so compelling about this program that we've created is that that sports frame brings in the capacity, this sort of formal, structured way to talk to kids in the game and around the game about how to behave themselves. And not only how to behave themselves, how not to be mean online, but specifically how not to be mean online because it ends up failing your own game anyway. So for the first time, you know, we've tried this through years, trying to figure out how do you make kids deal with conflict online without name calling or, or without melting down and crying. And it's always very difficult because a lot of it comes off as sort of this sort of finger wagging mom outside the screen. And I'm, I mean, no disrespect to other moms because I'm one of them too. And I do get my finger out sometimes. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's very hard to get this to change much when this space, you're not in it, right? And the thing about esports is that you've got coaches and near peers, and your team communications are tied to this frame of sportsmanship, sportspersonship. I don't know what to call it these days. <laughs> um, so forgive me if I'm not using the right language, but that framing does this incredible work. I mean, we were just, I was just pulling up graphs. We just finished our year one data analysis. And what you see is that the two big areas that the coaches are working on, these are coaches that we've vetted and trained and are there specifically to work on in-game strategy in a video game, right? Like you can't get any nerdier than this. But when you look at the talk of what they're doing in, with the kids, the two biggest indicators are equity and social emotional resilience. So what's happening? What's happening is that the coach is this superstar great gamer who's a whole, you know, two years into college. They're all college STEM majors by choice in the program. And these kids, these teenagers, these, these college kids, they are kids now to me, sorry. But these college <laughs> kids are able to interact with teens and have conversations with them about how to not be toxic in a way that actually sticks. And when you look through the data, what you find is that I think I have to honestly say this is probably the first example of programming I've seen where it is transformative to kids. Many of those kids have never had a conversation with anyone about, um, in any serious way that stuck, about like why being awful to some other stranger, even if it's anonymous, is a bad idea. And the sports frame sort of ties it directly to metrics. You can see that when you lose your mind, in a game, it's bad for your team and it's, get, it's bad for the game. So, you know, we're doing all of this STEM work and all of this content work, and that's beautiful. You know, I mean, all this graph, the clubs that we've built, kids are doing all this amazing production, including starting to run the events themselves. But I have to say the most dramatic output I've seen so far has been that sort of, I guess for the first time, seeing a way to cut through this notion of, um, I don't know, to, to sort of cut to the heart of like why it is that this toxicity is so bad. And especially in a space for gaming where kids have never had that conversation before. So I would say that's probably one of our biggest interventions. Yeah. So, so Terry, up on the screen, there's all these little boxes with all these acronyms and letters and circles and all that stuff. <laughs> what does all that mean? How does it relate to the, as Constance alluded to, um, the club, um, the, w w the concept of education and learning and workforce, and workforce preparation and workforce development. What does all this mean? Well, the beauty of the NACEF program, again, is it's not just an after-school club program. It, there is also a robust curriculum for high school students that goes along with this through ELA. So the opportunity to be able for a school to adopt something like this that has already met all the traditional standards, uh, next generation science standards, CTE, et cetera, um, that they can automatically be able to take in a package and incorporate directly with their students. The beauty of that is that if they decide to take certain modules and not take others, they can do that. They can tailor and custom make their curriculum uh, path if they would like to. After school programs have access to this as well and they can take as much or as little of that curriculum as they'd like to be able to include it in that learning. And the beauty of all of that is that it's completely free for the schools to use. So Joe, yes, sir. 
You've pretty much, uh, what do they say, uh, leap in the net will appear <laughs> or jump and maybe there's water. Yeah. Um, you've kind of jumped into all of this and you really have taken your work and in, in your foundation and invested time and energy. Um, sure, if you can, some of the things you've heard, some of the stories, some of the anecdotes, some of the positive attributes or outcomes that you've been able to see within the last year since you've been in it. Thanks. Um, I, I, let me give you some framework. Um, Joe Garner, Derek Fisher, my, some of my partners at Emerald. If one of those gentlemen would have come to me five years ago and said, we should invest in or we should start a website. And then, you know, here's what I'm going to tell you about this website. We're going to stream video games, people playing video games. And people were going to watch this. I would have told them to go back to the cannabis business because that's what they were in. <laughs> I couldn't have been more wrong. How many here have ever, ever heard of Twitch here? Okay, so a lot of you have. Okay. It's an amazing thing that people want to watch other people play video games to a number that, I just was at the presentation prior on eSports, to a number that dwarfs, absolutely dwarfs regular sports. You saw that on the video. So I had to figure it out. I'm a research analyst. I had to really kind of prove that out. And what I found, the numbers were, were more staggering than I would have ever even estimated once I heard the numbers. Every time we put a number up there, that number within a month is antiquated. It is moving so fast. So remember the days when Steve Jobs showed this thing called an iPhone and people didn't really get it. I remember going to see Consumer Electronics Show and all the Microsoft telling me that the iPhone was just a gadget and wait till you see what we come up with. What you're gonna find and there were some predictions, uh, uh, Eric Dar, the uh, president of, uh, of Harrisburg U, which is an unbelievable success story itself, was quoting numbers that are just mind-boggling. So the gentleman in the video said, if you're living under a rock. So from a purely research, investable community, there are going to be, there's going to be so much money made in this space. The beauty of what we're doing is we're not looking to make money. We're trying to use this platform to get to a kid that maybe hasn't been able to get to, been playing by themselves, putting them in an environment to participate. A very good anecdotal story for me. I don't understand League of Legends. I don't understand Overwatch. I went to the World Championship of Overwatch. I just don't understand the game. I just, uh, I, I watch it. I was with the UCLA team the other night. They were trying to explain it to me. They both took turns, they all took turns, like 15 of them, and they were trying to explain, they finally gave up. I was, I was, uh, uh, but, but, and I have so many stories about that, but here's a story that really stuck to me. I can't understand Fortnite. If anybody of you have watched Fortnite, it's the closest thing to poker in a video mm. game that I have ever watched. There are strategies, there are, you, there's a risk reward. The way it works is you jump onto this island and the island field starts to shrink. And on the left hand side, there's a hundred of you on the island and they start to dissipate when they knock each other off. I'm always telling my kids, hang out for a while, let the numbers go down, <laughs> and then, but they're telling me, no, I gotta get the goodies. My point is, there's a strategy there. That's one game I could watch because I'm always screaming at my kids, you know, hang back. My kids are like aggressive monsters. Right there. <laughs> All right. So, but, but here's the thing. This, this hit home to me in a very big way. All of a sudden, just what you were talking about, all of a sudden, my kids are 20, 18, 16, and 14. All right? And over the last two years, I've been watching them. And they had friends when they were 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 that were over and they were with all the time. And they were, we knew their families, they were really good kids, but through time and through different things that they did, they started to, not because they didn't like each other, they just kind of fell apart, like we do, all do. We get busy, whatever. All of a sudden, I started seeing their names being talked about in my family, the kids showing back up. They've re-entered our life because now they have a common bond. This is the single most, we didn't say this enough, the single most inclusive, activity yeah. that I have ever seen. And I'm talking inclusive, there's not one part 
of anything, any area that isn't inclusive about this. So watching my kids re, get reinvigorated with old friends and becoming the friends that they were before was because of the way they communicate. Like you said, down the cul-de-sac, that's how they communicate. And that makes their bond stronger. So this, this, this notion that I had, the knucklehead notion that I had that video games were bad, was poppycock. All right? I saw good behavior just in my own Petri dish at home. And so I could tell you a thousand stories of how I've seen this, but I can just tell you from when I spoke at lunch till I walked into this place, I've been approached by about 10 people that say, somebody said he was from Finland, they want to do it in Finland, somebody wants to do it here, because the people that get it, that aren't under the rock, now start to understand when you expose them to what they built, is this is a, this is a Rosetta Stone of sorts for all kids inclusively. And I'm gonna tell you one other story. I have a foundation, we do the traditional things. We do after school, we do feeding and all that stuff. And interestingly enough, Terry have gone to a number of schools and I have to all kinds of schools. And we're incorporating old foundational ways and but combining with this. So we had a school say to us, could you do a preschool program with this? I said, well, and they said, like six o'clock in the morning. I said, what kids ever gonna wanna come to play video games at six o'clock in the morning? Well, they said, well, no, it's that. Plus, these kids haven't eaten since 12 o'clock the day before. And if you wrap around your traditional foundational stuff around this, you're accomplishing many things. Wow. So many foundations that are doing, we will be able to do something other than sitting around or supposedly doing their homework. We can be teaching at those moments as well. So we're doing that. We're wrapping around our after school feeding program, our preschool program, our before school, or we're starting our before school feeding program. And that intersection of traditional foundation work and new foundation work is gonna change things greatly. So Terry, when we talk about the concept of competition in gaming, we all know that you know, kids play against each other or someone wins and they win a prize of some kind. Um, so this concept of NASAF is, as you say, much more about learning. So they have these things called beyond the game challenges. Um, and that's connected to kind of workforce development that you talked about and learning. Could you elaborate a little bit upon what that means? Sure, it's really identifying those areas in the ecosystem that are in the color and all those different positions that are available and then targeting in specifically on a student, let's say, that's in fandom art, that really loves the graphic design and perhaps is really fascinated by the characters of the game but doesn't necessarily want to play the game. So it gives them an opportunity to be able to compete against their peers in an area that they are interested in, uh, perhaps creating the logo for their club, and, uh, and then winning some type of scholarship on behalf of that. Uh, and it's exciting to be able to, to connect that again with that career aspiration and the learning because these are great areas for them to explore. It's giving them real world scenarios that they can actually hands on be able to identify and take ownership of themselves. This is an empowerment program. It's really about making sure the students feel empowered to be able to own this club, to find the club as to what they want it to be, and be able to explore any area that they want to be involved in. So connecting that to what we desperately need with workforce development, and also creating a mentorship program that goes along with this uh, between different areas of opportunity to show them, you really like to be able to do this type of graphic design? Did you know that there are many different opportunities for you to have careers in that and oh by the way here's the education path that it takes to get there which may or may not involve a four-year degree and I think that that's another uh, wonderful advocate you know to the program yes yeah, so Constance I'll ask you a, a little bit about that you at University of California in the Orange County Department of Ed took what's up there and actually created um, what's sitting on the screen and you worked with teachers to create this curriculum and the like could you talk a little bit about kind of what is that curriculum? You know, when we talk about it being credentialed, what does that mean and, yeah. and how did that come about? Yeah, I, I think it was just magic. That's how it came out. I, <laughs> I honestly, I've been doing games for learning for a long time and I've, I've never had teachers in English language arts line up to build an esports curriculum for four years. It's going to get credentialed in high school as college bound. What? 
that doesn't happen. That, that just doesn't happen. I remember looking at you and being like, I don't know what you've done with the schools here <laughs> locally, <laughs> but this conversation is not one that I've ever had before in my lifetime. Um, but as so, you know, we so. We wanted a league. We knew we needed a club around it because of all the activity we wanted kids doing. All of them game, but not every kid wants to be on stage. And all the action isn't just on stage. That's just what you see. There's, you know, it's just like NBA. What's the old adage about? For every player, there's like a hundred people making that, uh, helping that player play, making the game happen. Okay, same model. So we were building out like workshops on our college campus. Kids were coming in in droves. We were doing things like, how do you overclock your PC? How do you analyze your data so you could actually get better at being a support person, whatever it may be. We wanted to codify that. So we were trying to figure out, how are we going to make it so that we can scale this thing up? And it just so happens enough schools in our area around UCI and Orange County we're really interested in like, okay, we'll put the thing in now, but let's actually see if we could build out more on this. Could we build out something like a high school curriculum? So we sat down for a period of months. We got in about 12 master English language arts teachers of all varieties, everywhere from say Butte all the way down to, gosh, I don't even know, I mean Saddleback. We had a range of teachers who came in and we just sat down and we met every week and we just like worked out a curriculum. Now, we originally thought we'd go for STEM curriculum, and then when we looked at actual next-gen science standards, we were like, well, obviously, we can hit the ones that are about communication, the ones about habits of mind, but we're not going to teach chemistry through eSports, right? There's going to be some basic content science knowledge that we don't want to replace. So then we realized, why don't we go for an English language arts line, because this is entirely infused with, with argument, with expository text writing and communication across all medium. But then let's infuse it with STEM and let's tie it directly to careers. Because if you've worked with teenagers long enough, you know that there is a lot of illiteracy where kids don't even know what jobs are out there. So, you know, you talk to a middle school and they'll say, I want to be an NBA star, or now it's an esports star, or my dad, which is fabulous. But there's like a range of things that they could also consider that they just don't know about. So we spent a period of months with teachers. Uh, we went back and forth. We finally came up with original draft documents. We actually submitted it, and it was we went through another round of revisions. But it's now a fully credentialed curriculum that can be used as an alternative English language arts four years. You don't have to take it four years. You can take it one year and then drop out. You know, take the other normal English. But for a lot of kids. Um, Dare I say for a lot of boys in schools, you know, I don't know if you're paying attention, but you know, boys read on average two grades below level. They are basically opting out and failing in most literacy coursework. They perform woefully poorly on things like the NAEP. Um, and that has been going on for so long that it's no longer treated like a crisis. That's like a 30-year-old pattern. So sitting in that, in that English language arts and providing this sort of game-based way in order to encounter all the same standards and still be college prep, if that's what you choose to do, was really sort of our unicorn. Um, and we made it happen. We made it happen because um, our Department of Education was involved from the very beginning, and because it was students who wrote their curricula out. So that now, I know now we just, is it public news that we just got mm -hmm. that? So it just, we just got a whole nother curriculum written that is the career technical education pathway that's games-based and esports-based. You know, I just want to say here too. Um, to me, the real to me the real commitment is about you know, um, for students in school, even high performing uh, high performing students who are doing well and going to college, they will tell you that they view K through 12 education as credentialing and nothing more. Now, I'm a college professor and I do education, so that is like the worst news of my lifetime to hear that an entire generation of kids, even the kids like your children who are doing beautifully in school, even they, when asked, will say, school is about test taking and credentialing. It's not about learning. So to me, the real point of this was trying, I hope, trying to demonstrate to students that all of that content that we cover in school is actually deeply related to the things that they love, even esports. To me, if we can do that, if we can make school feel relevant again, then I feel like we will have done our job. Well, I think you have done a great job. And one of the things that you can do is you go to the website. And one of the things that I love on the website 
or the videos they have, and there's just two points I want to make. Number one, this program is not just great for the kids, not just great for the teachers and administrators, that there's a bridge there, but they're also building bridges between the kids and their parents. There's a beautiful video on there about the, the, this, the parents that had this kid that they didn't understand where he was going, and now through eSports, it's like a love, love affair. But this isn't <laughs> just him, it's happening everywhere. You're building bridges. This inclusive nature is building bridges. And if anybody saw during the Super Bowl, the Microsoft commercial that talked that where the kid was running around the neighborhood and said that he's gonna do it. And so you're not only back this inclusive nature, not only with physically handicapped, but what Terry and I are working on, I was a trustee for Merrickey. If any of you guys have interest in, in uh, autism or kids in the spectrum, we're now working with kids in the spectrum so that work with them to compete each other, so to get them in with the other kids, the, nor the so-called normal kids. There's, you can boil the ocean with ideas here, and it's because of what they've built, what, what Gerald, what Constance, and now what we're working on, to reach out and reach kids where they, want, where they love to be and then make something out. I think it's magic. So hold tight. We have another deck that they have to load up. So if you can please load up the deck, and then we're going to swap out one person because we're going to get into a little bit of the kind of guts of what all this is so you have a better understanding of the details, how it's set up, how it works, et cetera. And Dr. Daniel Werenfeld is going to come up and, and take Joe's seat here for a minute. And he specializes in issues around inclusion and bigotry and racism and equity and access and how that becomes a lens of, of what we're doing. So we're going to go ahead and swap out and put up the other video, if you, or the, excuse me, the other PowerPoint. That's the wrong PowerPoint. Um, there you go. So Joe, if you can go ahead and um, give the mic over to Daniel here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and start on this. And then when we get back to Q&A, we'll ask you to come back up and, and do all that with us, OK? Um, so let, let, let's take a minute here and talk about this into some greater detail. So you have an understanding about what Joe has, has really become yeah, passionate yeah. about and what we're all, what we're all talking about. Um, you're going to hear from myself, Constance, um, Terry here, and Dr. Werenfinnig, who's a professor at the University of California at Irvine, around how the clubs work, what the curriculum is in some greater detail, and, and how it operates. So let me kind of tell you the story a little bit about how it started and you'll get a sense of what it is. Um, we were asked in the Samueli Foundation to look at esports as a potential business investment, as Joe was talking about. And we looked at that and we thought, you know, we weren't really sure whether there was something there there. But what we did see was that there was, as everyone's talked about, this concept of this hook or this Trojan horse. How do you go ahead and reach kids where they are? How do you go ahead and connect passion and play and purpose or learning around all of this. And you heard Constance talk a little bit around the curriculum and what that looks like. So we decided to put all this together, but we did it from an education lens. This is not an esports program. This is an education platform that uses esports. And what we created was a board made up of the Chancellor of the University of California, the Superintendent of Schools at Orange County Department of Ed, the Dean of the School of Education at uh, Cal State Fullerton, the president of Chapman College, and one of the leading uh, CEOs of an accelerator incubator called Octane in Orange County, to be the guide rails and the guideposts to make sure that this was always about the child and the student and the learning, and figuring out how to match esports to learning rather than how to match learning into esports. And it was based upon a set of mission and values and, and structures that you could see up on the screen um, that really became the moral compass of how do you really think about how we educate and work with kids and be able to give them opportunity. Um, so let's go ahead and play the first video and we'll hear from the superintendent of schools. The Orange County High School Esports League is connecting play and learning, sports and education to help kids grow, thrive and be the best they can be. Games are really challenging and demanding. They require complex problem solving. You have this whole ecosystem around it that has all the benefits of sports, plus the connection to technology which brings in STEM. 
approximately 91% of our K-12 education has an interest in video games. What does that tell you? You know, the power of these games and the power of online learning, in fact. You have communication, collaboration, all the things that are necessary in the world of work. Character is really foundational, I believe, to what we're doing today. This is it. This is what it's all about. So you got to see what a superintendent of schools. Uh, Dr. Maharis is the superintendent of Orange County Department of Ed. 455,000 K-12 kids in 27 school districts who understand to get what this is about. Let's hear what Joe alluded to earlier, which is um, interviewing a parent, uh, some parents around why and how it's made a difference in the lives and the relationship with their child. So if you could play this video, please. When Connor came home and said he wanted to be in the eSports club, I almost fell over because I just couldn't believe it. I had been asking him for so long to get involved in the school. He signed up for some clubs and didn't follow through. I think one of his friends um, suggested that he join the team and he said, I want to start, you know, I want to be on this team. You know, being a gamer myself, it does teach you a lot of skills. It does, I believe, enhance cognitive skills. But most importantly, I, I see a, a huge difference in just his overall behavior. His grades have improved significantly over last year. Been drafted to be the captain of his team. Uh, it's put him into a leadership position and, and it's required him to step up. He'll tell me about, you know, one of his games and I would ask him, well, what are you going to do about it differently next time? You know, how are you going to motivate them to do something different? So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good challenge for him and it's a good learning experience for him. So my interest in gaming started when I was bored at home and I wanted to play with a friend and gaming just was a way for him to play at his house and me to play at my house and not have to really go anywhere to have social interactions with each other. I think one of the benefits of, of you know, playing these games globally is that you know, my kid is exposed to something that they would never be exposed to normally. Like, he's got a friend in Russia that he's playing games with all the time. And he's talking about how funny this guy is and you know they're exchanging um, things about different languages and things and these are things that, that he would never be exposed to if he was on a soccer team for example. I'd say the most memorable times you have is when you first start playing a game and you meet those friends that kind of teach you how to play when you don't know how to play. I would encourage other parents to you know ask their kids what they're doing and why, you know, what they're excited about at school. And, you know, if it's gaming, if they're interested in gaming, you know, try something different and just try supporting what they're interested in because sometimes the unexpected might happen. Just embracing gaming and esports on the campus, getting involved with friends, developing leadership skills, um, all of those things are just so important and I wish that other parents um, would pay attention and and get involved because it's just, I feel like it's, it's a wave and we're right at the crest of the wave. So they set a pretty high bar on what that looks like. So I'd like to be able to turn it over to Constance and Constance just tell me when to go ahead and turn the slide. Because part of what we as a foundation are invested in and what all of us who are in academia in one fashion or another are interested in is so what's the evidence? You know, it's nice to hear stories, but what's really the evidence behind that? So again, Constance, if you can just maybe add to some of the things you said earlier or follow up on some of that. Sure. Um, so where to start? Um, so I mentioned earlier that you know, there's now almost 15 years of research on games and learning. When I first started studying games and learning, there was nothing because the medium was new and was not considered worthwhile of academic research investigation. Now we have multiple publications. There's um, interdisciplinary scholars that work on this um, and several different academic conferences. Um, the sports literature is also equally compelling. So what you're seeing on, like at the very top that sports are associated with higher GPAs, fostering personal growth, satisfaction in school, actually completing and graduating school. Um, 
A lot of that is an underlying construct called persistence or tenacity, but basically this is sort of internal locus of attribution. Kids involved in sports tend to believe that their success is not due to luck or some personal biological factor you're born with or without, but that instead it's a mindset that says, um, it's called the growth mindset that believes, it's a belief that your success is attributed to your hard work, and so sports cultivates that in kids and that in turn actually um, is a strong predictor of academic success. Um, and also not bailing out the moment it gets difficult. Because if you believe that in fact it's due to your effort, that means that you can double down on your effort and conquer it a second time. Games actually resonate there, where, well there, whether they're physical sport games or digital. Um, Certainly, I've mentioned uh, scientific reasoning. In the games world, um, there are several meta-analyses. Uh, scientific reasoning is one of them, but you see, for example, there was one done by SRI about five, six years ago through the Glass Lab, where if you compare traditional materials to something like game-based materials in K through 12, what you see is a 23% increase. That's two grades improvement for kids in school using games versus non-games. I will tell you, as someone in this field for too long, what you start to see is especially that bottom third of kids actually level up and start to perform like your successful moderate kids. So a lot of that gain is from the bottom third of kids of school. And you see that again and again in game-based programs that are out there. There are now amazing game-based programs in every state within the U.S. and internationally. So, so Constance, when we talked about earlier this framework about learning, could you talk a little bit about you alluded to the credentialing. It happens to be credentialed by the state of California. Yes. And you have four years, and it's kind of elaborated on a little bit in the slide here. Could you just kind of get into that a little deeper, please, and unpack that? Sure. So um, you know, we have national standards. For a course to be designated as credentialed and college-bound, you have to be able to show that what kids are doing throughout every week that in aggregate it's going to meet the standards and they will be able to learn what they have to learn in order to apply to college. So it's a fairly high bar to set. Um, we sat down and took all of the English uh, language arts standards for 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, but then we added to it STEM standards, which actually pulled a couple math standards, but let's set that aside. Then we added to it standards from the CTE because Esports actually is that whole mixed bag. Frankly, I think it was too ambitious, or I thought it was, until it actually went through, and I was like, I can't believe we just pulled that off. Um, so it was a really ambitious high bar to set, but it was driven by first analyses of what actual potentials and, and current actual work was going on in year one of our league. So in the first year, again, students can opt in or opt out. You don't have to take all four. So the first year is focused on games and simulations, meaning that kids complete the entire English 9 curriculum, but in addition, they learn about game design, specifically around things like grand narratives, or what does it mean to have sort of the great hero of stories, games fits there well. English 10, we focus on entrepreneurship. Here, kids are getting into, like, how do you do startup companies? What does it mean to market it? But honestly, our teachers actually baked into it um, um, uh, what was the term for it? Um, social hacking, so social entrepreneurship, so baked into the curriculum isn't simply the idea that you're writing for marketing, but actually how do you change the way so social systems work? So <clears throat> kids actually work on things like toxicity or how to make games better, how to make games safer for which ages and how to rate them. English 11, same, uh, we do all of the standards, but then we add marketing. Here they're doing a lot of public-facing writing, which if you know much about um, writing generally in high school, uh, expository text is one of the hardest ones to hit. Narrative is usually comes earlier and easier. So here we're really focused on expository text for a public audience. And then the fourth one is hospitality tourism, and it's set up so that the, the seniors are actually eventually running the events themselves. So the reason it's tied to hospitality is because they have to figure out how are they going to run. We set up the league brackets and we have the coaching and the refs to make sure that there's an outside voice keeping everything fair in terms of the competition. But the actual skirmishes and events, the kids have to plan it all out. How do you budget? How do you arrange for the filming? How do you arrange for the shoutcasters, et cetera? Um, so, 
Daniel, um, you do a lot of work around equity, inclusion, diversity at the University of California. Why don't you um, take a few minutes and talk about your role in this from that, from that lens? Thank you. Um, so at the university, obviously, as a, the UC system is a very um, strong, very diverse environment. So I've been working for 15 years in that space around conflict resolution, first of all, and then um, more and more issues of diversity. Race is a major issue for us and um, in, in other forms as well. And then um, into all of that, coming and learning more about the esports um, approach and what's going on at UCI and having a number of my students being actually part of the esports teams as well and being players and all of that, uh, we had more and more conversation around it, said that this is actually, as Constant alluded to, esports is an incredible place for bringing people together. The ability, and we have done this research of when we do the surveys of people, about nearly two-thirds would say that the teams, the people they get exposed to in esports, the group of people they're engaging with is much more diverse than even their friendship group or the people they're exposed to at university, which is an incredible high bar coming from UCI, which is a very, you know, very diverse place. So the opportunity then to you know, take all of these programs and the learning that we have, and having done for 15 years uh, in that space to esports is what we have done with the help of the Samueli Foundation. Uh, and uh, one of the key ideas is that esports is not just the teams, the players, it's also the teachers. That when issues come up with uh, the team, conversation, difficult issues, toxicity, issues of, of biases, whatever it is, it's not just the players itself, it's also the teachers in the classroom who can help and to can help to use our help, our lesson plans and all the stuff that we develop at the university then to talk to the esports teams about it. So we have adapted our lesson plans, our resource guides for the teachers and for the coaches for these teams to have the conversation. As Constant mentioned and here before Terry as well, that it's not just the game, it's the conversation after the game. It's when you're done with the game, when you sit, when you have the cup of coffee or whatever you do, that you then talk about it and figuring out how can you use what happens in the game as a great starting point to more education on diversity inclusion. Issues of microbios, of gender, a major issue in esports still, um, that comes out and so we're using all our resources we have on that. A second thing that we have learned at the university a lot is it's not just for older people, 10, 20 years older, to tell you know, the current players of what to do and what to learn. It's peer-to-peer -peer learning. And um, as we mentioned in the video, these players are celebrities. I mean, in true form, celebrities. Mm -hmm. I mean, the names, none known to us, they are, when they're walking even on campus, our esports team, there's a crowd of people around them asking for signatures. I mean, they are recognized. So their voice to speak onto issues of, of diversity, inclusion, and also their own mistakes are very, very powerful. So we've been working with these celebrity players to creating video content to ask them to speak to their peers about what they can do better, what they learned to playing, and what the opportunities are in doing all of that. And, and you've created lesson plans and workshops that are part of what this is that then has that near peer mentoring relationship and learning opportunities for all the clubs around the country that are part of this. Right, and then also, especially then also resources for teachers. Depending where you are, you know, the resources you may have in your school is limited. That's, that's something that we learned at the university that we actually really well resourced on these issues, but that schools, teachers feel very vulnerable, you know? I mean, these are tough questions, especially when it comes around race and gender and all these issues. So coming and having resources for them and places that they can engage with others is very, very important to support them in these efforts. So it's a lot more than just gaming. It is a lot more than gaming. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Terry, you're doing this work in Pennsylvania in the East with Joe and the like. Could you talk a little bit about when we talk about the club, what the club is all about? Sure. Um, it is a scholastic after-school program, which means that any organization, it could be a school or a nonprofit organization that serves uh, students in grades nine through 12 right now, uh, are eligible to be able to participate. And it's a wonderful way to be able to get these students to collaborate. Um, they're already sneaking off and playing video games on their own on their phones or whatever they're doing anyway. And, uh, and, and while we're infusing that learning and the STEM 
them into this. Um, again, as a former museum director, it's, it's always about trying to find incredible, uh, interesting programs for these students to be able to do with these after school programs. And being scholastic, it's focused in STEM and you need to try to make it fun. Well, this is what that's all about. And there are so many different types of opportunities to be able to have these students get empowered and be involved and the support that the uh, that esports is is being able to bring to them and specifically NACEF and this program is really tremendous. As you can see on the screen, uh, there's a club charter, there's a, a code of conduct uh, that students have to sign off on and understand that they are going to be held accountable for their actions and what they do and how they collaborate with others and the respect that they show others. It is truly about uh, being a, a team together and showing that kind of respect. The the toolkits that are involved are really to help support the general manager who leads that, but also to be able to help the students uh, really understand their role in that ecosystem and be able to thrive. There's also competition. You can participate in a sanctioned uh, competition that's in uh, the North America competition that focuses on one game every semester. And uh, when you do that, you get put in brackets and you get to play against all these other teams, which is very exciting uh, across North America. But there's also an opportunity too, if you have students who wanna play a specific game like Fortnite and they wanna be able to reach out to anyone else in, that, in, in uh, NASEP to be able to participate, they can do so. There's coaching that's involved. These coaches are vetted uh, by UCI. They, for background checks, for criminal background, and child abuse clearances, all of that. And then they are given virtually to a club to be able to coach them on that specific game. But it's not like the coaching you think when you think of traditional sports. They are really trying to help empower these students to be able to thrive in this type of environment and come up with these ideas and the strategies on their own. And then obviously, as we talked about, with that career link is really critical, giving them those hands-on activities to be able to experience different types of ways to be able to get involved in potential careers moving forward. This is just an example of what some of these um, ideas of what these toolkits will entail. There's just a general, what is eSports? Because a lot of people don't know yet uh, what eSports is. Um, everything from that to developing that team website, getting those students involved and excited about things that they're being able to do. How do you manage a club? We actually have somebody on staff who has office hours, who you can call in at a specific time and uh, ask any question that you want to, as well as reach out via Discord, which is a social media a platform uh, for our general managers to be able to participate in and, and do it that way. There are all kinds of workshops and clinics. There's a tournament organization, how to build a PC. A lot of students are really interested in doing that themselves as well. All of this is free. There is no cost to the school to be able to participate in any of these great toolkits. Yes, and there's no act, there's no activation fee. There are a lot of other esports clubs out there that will charge you an activation fee and a fee per student to participate. This program does not do any of that. It is too truly, we talk about the inclusivity, we talked about reaching these students, specifically the underserved that we've been working with uh, with the Emerald Foundation. You would not believe how op this opportunity is really um, overwhelming to them uh, as, as far as something that they've never thought they would be able to experience. So again, the coaches, who they are, near peer mentors specifically, highly ranked in that particular game title to be that expert for them, and, uh, and just offering support all around to the students as well as the general managers. Let me keep going. Go ahead. Wow. Yes, yeah, so Acosta, let's talk a little bit about, <laughs> um, when we talk fine. about gaming and competition, um, a little bit about the kinds of challenges and competitions that are not about gaming. They're about other components of what we call the ecosystem. Of which there are. I mean, I think that honestly, again, it goes back that we really focus on the club model and not just the team. You know, everyone wants to, to sort of single visionly stare at the team that's competing. Even in professional esports, everyone sort of all stares at the team that's competing on stage. And yet behind it are all of these other roles. And so part of what we're doing is trying to engage kids through the club in those roles so they game together. And in fact, because esports is a bit fluid, so who is the top five players and the second top five players on any given moment could change from week to week because the ladders are that stringent. So the team is a little bit fluid and then the club surrounds it. So we build in several challenges that are around specifically adding kind of a limelight to those various other roles outside of the team itself 
things like logo design, things like running events, et cetera. And I think that that actually builds sort of this richer space where you get not only um, more students, but also more diverse students who are interested. And because we change games, you know, um, if you, it's just like television shows, different games pull different audiences. So we're really thoughtful about what are the official games that we're gonna do the big competitions on. But behind that are lots of skirmishes that are much more regional, lots of student-led activity that allows us to pull a lot of different kids in that may not otherwise compete in various um, competitions on stage or any other ways. And do these kids get monetary prizes, gifts? What, I mean, how do, how do they get uh, rewarded or acknowledged for their competition? You tell me. Uh -huh. How do they get rewarded? And so, so, okay, so I'll answer that then, because I know that. Um, so we just did that recently. We had a competition around NHL 19. Mm -hmm. Kids wanted to play NHL 19, so we set up a tournament around that, and we had kids compete, and there was a scholarship to the person who, because there's no money given to the kids. It's all scholarships given to the student for college or post-secondary education, or to the institution itself to support the institution around its learning and its capacity for teaching. Um, so we did competitions where we gave out $25,000 worth of scholarships last week, around NHL 19, the smallest portion went to the winner of the NHL 19 um, tournament. The majority of the funds went to the person who created the best logo, there's wow. one there, um, the one who created the best website, the one who created the best flyer, mm -hmm. the one who blogged the best, the one of all the competitions, because you do what's called PR or shoutcasting, is a term of art that's used for this, who is the be best shoutcaster? And all of these individuals competed amongst each other and used the coaches and the general managers as the judges to judge who that was. And then all of them were present. Some were flown in uh, because we're now in, in, in nine months in 30 states with over 400 high schools and over 5,000 kids, which is remarkable for something like this. And they were flown in and recognized and honored for their work, not so much in gaming, because really, they may have played some other games, but they didn't play NHL 19, but they really were into fandom art. They were into logo design and development. Uh, they were into creating websites and things like that. So they were acknowledged for what that is. So when Joe talked about the concept, concept of inclusivity, it's very much around how do you bring people together who are disenfranchised, don't feel like they belong, have a real skill, or maybe casual gamers, and want a space and a place where they can experience and be able to use the experience they have and the love that they have around uh, things like that. Um, so if you're interested in wanting to know more about what this is, um, the website, as you saw in some of the videos, is really, really detailed. Um, and we probably have 50 or so videos. Yeah. Um, in fact, where this started in Orange County, California, ESPN currently this week is on site in Orange County, and they're doing a multi-day uh, video shoot around what's happened in NACEF in this league and where it's going, and it'll air in May um, on ESPN Sports. But you can go onto the website, you can look at the videos, you can look at the curriculum, you can see how kids participate, um, and you can activate. And Terry, why don't you take a minute and just share, how do you activate a club? What do you do if you want to start? It is really hard. You just go to the website and click on the activate button. <laughs> no, I, I, I did it as a test when I first started with this organization. It, it literally took me 30 seconds, I think, to be able to do, and that might be uh, conservative. But uh, it's very easy. It's around uh, understanding, do you have a general manager? Do you have somebody who's going to be able to take the lead uh, with this? And then putting your, in your school information. Um, you're gonna need to know, obviously, who your superintendent or whoever, the administrator who's in charge, and there, there's a technical person who's in charge at your school uh, to be able to know. And then once you have that activation and you fill in all your information about your school, 
you then start to collect the rosters and you, you, you try to get whatever students are interested in participating. And the exciting part is most of these schools are overwhelmed uh, by the students that want to participate. Some of these students have actually gone to their administration with PowerPoint presentations as to why they should participate specifically in NACEF that we've seen before. Uh, so the energy and the excitement is there and is it just about getting that out there. You'll have uh, the code of conduct that the students will sign off, the parents will sign the waivers. That's all electronic. Uh, so it's very easy to be able to get things started. And again, there's no cost at any point to do this throughout that process. And that opens up then, what, a portal and the website and it, gives you all the toolkits absolutely. and workshops and all of that. Once you're actually, once you're activated, that portal will open and all of the different resources that we talked about earlier will be at your fingertips. And, uh, and, and that's the beauty of it. You know, you alluded to the fact that kids tend to be the biggest uh, initiators of this in school. Just to give you a story that occurred a couple of weeks ago in Orange County, Orange County Unified, or Orange Unified School District, the district superintendent said, well, we're just not going to do this. It's not something we want to be able to do. The kids, with support from some of their parents, did exactly what you said. They went ahead to a school board meeting, and they actually brought kids and parents with them, and they did a formal presentation to the school district. They took the evidence that Constance has developed in the research she's done, and during that segment where you can have general comments from the public, they actually did a full-blown <laughs> presentation to the school board at Orange Unified as to why they wanted to be able to have a club in NASEF to be able to participate. And it was the evidence and the research that demonstrated that, um, that allowed the school board to say, wow, as Joe said, I lived under a rock. I didn't understand. I didn't see the value and the potential on it. And if these are where the kids are and we want to go to where these kids are, then we should think about doing that. And it was the kids who got together and actually changed the decision of the superintendent by going over her head and <laughs> getting the school board to allow that to be played within, uh, within their school. I've actually spoken to several school boards and I can tell you the response has been um, really wonderful. I have had the two most frequent comments that are made to me are, um, thank you for not creating a program and presenting to us that's something that we literally would shove down our students' throats and say, like this. Instead, you are meeting them where they are, engaging in something that they already love and infusing that learning into it. So thank you for creating, they, they do. So that's the, that's the first one. And the second one was really around, wow, I had no, because I always ask the question when I start, how many of you know what eSports is? And the only people in the room that ever raise their hand are any students that are there and the uh, IT people. <laughs> that's it, that's it. None of them have heard of it, they have no idea. And my presentation, I'm only really allowed to have 15 minutes so I just give the research that Candace has uh, that Constance has done and when, when Constance talks about with a lot of passion about why this is so important to students that comes out through us as well and they just uh, they hang on to that and anonymous votes every single time do you ever run into problems with IT folks that say now nah, I'm not gonna open up those ports or I'm not gonna do this or I'm not gonna allow it how do you address that Yes. So, 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 the, so it's, it's one thing to say we are going to meet the students where they are and embrace what they love and create this wonderful partnership together between learning and the students and everyone's going to sing Kumbaya and make it wonderful. But yet the game that you play has to be mission focused along with our school and oh, can't right. have X, Y, and Z. And yeah. pretty much what they're doing is playing online checkers. I mean, that's what's left. So, um, so it's an opportunity to be able to say, well, you can lock everything down and you can protect as much as you want. Um, maybe it might be better to have healthier conversations around why, because guess what? At home, they're doing all of this. They're watching all of this. <laughs> they're, 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 you know, they're, they're not being sheltered by it as what you think they are because they have access. They have the phone. 
and they have access to everything. So instead, let's look at the code of conduct. Instead, let's talk about expectations. Instead, let's talk about cyberbullying. Let's have mm -hmm. conversations about those types of things. If that is the fear of the school, in case that's happening, they need to know this anyway because these are real world problems that they're facing. So let's have healthy conversations around it. So there have been clubs that we know of where notwithstanding all that, the IT people still put up their hands and say no. Um, they've gotten around it by partnering with libraries yeah. and we have Boys and Girls Clubs and YMCA's and other programs where they do the learning in school and they do the gaming and connecting in school and out of school and other rich institutions of learning. Um, have you seen that kind of evolve and develop over time? Yes. So, um, and, you know, we try, obviously, to, to help um, inform the IT people and help try to work with them as much as possible. Uh, but there are great opportunities with many after-school programs. We have a lot of public libraries uh, that have these great after-school programs. The Boys and Girls Club is another wonderful uh, partner to be able to use. And they, they aren't as... Um, concerned so much about uh, locking everything down and making sure that these students have zero access. Again, what they're trying to do is to be able to help have healthy conversations and, and, and educate. Great. Um, so we'd like to open it up now. We've kind of talked to you to death for a while. Um, if you have questions, we'd be glad to answer. You can direct it to the panel. Joe, if you don't mind uh, maybe just pulling up a chair and come on up, or if you want to direct it to Joe, he's sitting in the audience there. <laughs> about why he's doing what he's doing. Uh, but we'd love to be able to answer some questions if you have any. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Jill Hodges. I run a company called FireTech. We're uh, I run a company called FireTech, and we're based in London. And we do tech education extracurriculars. And um, I came to this because I'm really interested in eSports as a way to teach STEM and as a way to sort of enter into tech, and especially with some of these kids who um, might not feel like that's for them. Um, and so I'm just curious about what's going on in Europe. We're based in London and, and across Europe. And so do you see initiatives like this happening in Europe? Um, do you see, I can imagine a lot of resistance from some of the parents in some places. Um, are there leagues and things that are happening in the UK, for example? So um, a lot of this is piecemeal knowledge because it's moving so quickly. Um, so far, what I understand, I've been in conversation with people in Germany, UK, um, and then a lot in Asia. So eSports is huge in Asia. The conversation is really around addiction, not violence. Um, very little to know. I don't know of any programs like this. Frankly, with all due respect, I don't know of any program like this in the US. We are the only program that does not hand wave when it comes to saying that we're going to make this educational and good for kids. Um, I also have, well, I'm just going to bluntly say it, like a lot of our talking points about like how this is relevant to not only STEM but social emotional learning, writing, whatever, have gotten taken up by other leagues. The problem is that, interesting, interest, interestingly, they're for profit and when you look under the hood there is nothing happening in terms of any content that might actually make good on the, con on the bridge between esports games and academic work. So I think there's a big fat zero there, probably. If you find something, I would love for you to share it with us, because I'm not convinced yet that we have a map of everything. I do know that right now, I'll be going out to the World um, Championship event in China, because they are very, very interested in this is a STEM vehicle. Now, that's a very different ecosystem, so I don't know whether or not our programming will work for them there. But there, the demand for esports, just you run the numbers, the demand is so high that there's interest in uh, even ideas like full-blown esports academies based on this curriculum. So we'll see. Well, I, I, I would add that since lunchtime, I've been approached by uh, the Netherlands, Mexico, uh, somebody in Japan wants to think about that. So spurring this interest, I don't know how we'll do this, but we're certainly, uh, we don't think less of the kids in those areas than we do of our own. No. So I think if there's a way that we can collaboratively work, uh, it might take a little more work. You're looking at about 50% uh, of the entire team working on this, and that's a, that's a slight exaggeration, uh, but we, we hope to add. And I think that if you have uh, assets that you can bring from a collaborative effort, I'm sure we would consider. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for the panel. Uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of the fact that you do put the focus on, on quality and rigor beyond just the 
rewards and the brand on top. The question I have for you, I'm really curious how you think about the question of tool versus goal. And so, you know, uh, I'm sorry, what was that? The question of tools versus goals, and so we all talk about the goals of education being the skills we want to see developed. Uh, if you, we start with the goal, then the question becomes, given a set of skills for a given particular cohort of students, what is the best tool to help them do that? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious about, especially as you look at the research side of this, for what kind of goals and what kind of cohorts of students do, do you find esports being the best tool to get them there, because otherwise we often end up saying music is the answer and sports is the answer and esports is the answer, and of course all of those are part of the answer, but they're often the answer for a given goal for a given cohort of people. So I'm just curious what your research shows about sure. who and, and what. So, so let me feel that for a second and turn it over to Constance. When we set this up, and it's one of the nice things of being in philanthropy, um, we're able to give grants to answer the questions that you talked about. So what we did was we gave a multi-year grant to University of California at Irvine mm -hmm. to do a longitudinal study that's an IRB approved study to be able to look at the nexus between learning and gaming and specifically esports and to really drill down and unpack what parts of learning are there, what's better than others, and what are the stimuli that actually um, make that particular learning module more valuable than another. So it's an iterative and organic process. I'll give you one example of something that kind of takes into consideration what we call all these 21st century skills that we, we always communicate about. Um, there's one school that's 100% uh, free and reduced lunch. And these are people who are um, two to three grade levels behind. Uh, many of them are antisocial. This English program was instituted uh, in the school because candidly, the principal of the school just didn't know what else to do. He heard about it, he said, well, you know, let me try and see what I can do. So they started to go ahead and do that, and as part of one of the classes, they had to tell a story in writing through gamification what their life's journey has been like. And they had to adopt a character in League of Legends and represent to the class about both in writing and um, orally um, why that character was relevant to them their powers, their weaknesses, the challenges, what it meant in their life. And then the class was able to give them feedback, and then the class went ahead and they said, okay, we would like you now to take a different character. And how would you relate to that character? And that person had to write about it, talk about it, understand it, analyze it, et cetera. And then that person had to go ahead and begin to build a, build a storybook around what her life would be like if she took the strengths of both and how it would impact her life and her life's journey, thinking about where it would go and what it would do. What that did for that individual was to change the trajectory of what her interest was in school beyond anything she could have ever thought of. That video is actually online, and you'd be able to download it and see it on the website. But the kinds of things you're asking about are exactly what we have uh, provided a grant to Constance and her team to be able to evaluate. Yeah, and we're doing paired comparisons within schools for students in the league and out. But the issue that you're getting at, I mean, so I'm inside of the Connected Learning Lab, Mimi Ito's work, and there's a bunch of scholars at UCI now that we've recruited to work on these topics, and this is a central enterprise for us. Um, you know, when you're doing interest-driven learning, the power of it is the fact that it's interest-driven, which means that you know, how you both work toward diversity and inclusion and equity and also try to keep it legitimately interest driven because you know you pick what we do in esports what was the number it's like 91% under 20 so esports is huge but that hidden underneath that is the complexity of for which game because you know, um, Street Fighter 2 is a very different crowd and a very different demographic of student, including ethnicity and SES, than League of Legends, than Overwatch. So in, in our league, we actually put a lot of sweat into what game are we going to pick? <laughs> I don't think I'm being dis disclosing too much by also saying, you know, there's these two different counter threads. One is we need to pick games that actually pull kids in because once we get them, they typically stay and they'll stay for the next games, but it's getting them there. And so sometimes you want to choose games because of who you know you'll bring in. That does sometimes run counter to the pressure 
real or imagined that we have to choose games that will be the least triggering for principles, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of, a lot of um, hand wringing around Fortnite because Fortnite is like the lingua franca for game kids, right? Like they all play it. It also means that all parents hate it, <laughs> mostly, at least a little, right? <laughs> Including myself, and I play Fortnite, but I also hate it a little, right? <laughs> so trying to find games that we can actually pull demographics, especially demographics in our kids that we really want to engage that really could use some enrichment you know what I'm talking about? I could really use someone acknowledging their interest and resourcing it up is not always parallel to what's going to not trigger terrible headlines and superintendents and principals coming down on you. And I don't know what the art of that is. So one person has his hand up and then unfortunately time has run out. So let's go ahead with one last question and then we can go ahead and on the side answer some questions if you have any. I appreciate this. Uh, I'm super, uh, superintendent in New Jersey and my mind is blowing right now from this concept. <laughs> I think it's great. Um, I know that a lot of my students would be really excited about this. So this is kind of like a nuts and bolts from a school perspective question. Tell me a little bit about what does practice look like? Um, what kind of equipment do you need? Um, and how do you go ahead and offer a program like this without decimating traditional sports? Yeah. Yeah, so those are great questions and we don't have enough time to answer them in detail. But I will say this. What we do, again, this is a philanthropic endeavor based upon education. What we do is we will get in touch with you either through Terry or Kevin or a group of people that we have who are teachers who are also gamers, and they will actually do an evaluation and an assessment with you. They will do a focus group with your educators, with your kids. They will do a review of the assets and resources that you have and make a written recommendation, all at no cost to you for you to think about how you want to implement this and what this is, and then they will walk through the process. I'll give you one last example, then we're done. Butte, where all the fire was, where Paradise, the city burnt down. Those kids did not want to go to the abandoned Sears building to go back to school. They needed something to get them back into education. These were thousands of people who lost their home. We went ahead with a group of other funders and gave them a grant to build out these eSport facility programs in conjunction with the superintendent up there, Tad Taylor, and some of the business community and the students, we created this whole new environment to attract kids to come back where there's no schools. All the schools are burnt down. Where they can go ahead now and they can enjoy themselves, have some social support amongst themselves, and now they're adding in all of the other pieces around what the learning is. So it's an iterative process, it's somewhat organic, and it's very tailored and not prescriptive to what people's needs are. So thank you all very much for your time. Please thank the panel for their time. I also just have to say, please thank the Samueli Foundation because without you guys taking a risk to do this, this yes. never would have happened. So thank you. Thank you all. And there are copies of the presentation and business cards in the back if you'd like to take any.